HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. I'm Lou Bank. And I'm Greg Benson. And this is an ad for Ancestral Agave Syrup, the critically acclaimed award-winning syrup that helps gringo bartenders better make margaritas, wait, wait, negronis, Lou, hold and up, Oaxacan hold up, wait. Old Are you just... Fashions? This is how you start your podcast. What? It's not an ad for Ancestral Agave Syrup. Well, of course it is. I'm just cutting costs by not paying writers to make something new. I'm just using an old script. You pay writers? Is that some kind of jab? No, I'm just saying what, that... What What are you saying? Well, look, we've got this amazing syrup that's made in an ancestral manner, cooked down from the sap of the agave, harvested the way these families would to make pulque. It's a quality product. It deserves yeah, a quality yeah. presentation. Yeah, okay, okay, hang on. <clears throat> ancestral agave syrup is made by real families following traditional methods, unlike the industrial Blue Weber syrup you get everywhere else. Ancestral is cooked down from aguamiel, harvested from Salmiana in Hidalgo, Mexico. It is the grade A Vermont maple to the sticky diner syrup you've been using for your cocktails. Ingredients matter, both in how your cocktail tastes and how you treat the earth. Ancestral is better for both. Is that good? Uh, sure. Or maybe confusing instead of cheesy. Uh, look, just visit AncestralAgave.com to learn more and to order your world-class agave syrup today. And we'll call that a wrap. Catch you next ad, Greg. Uh, hasta pronto? Ancestral Agave Syrup. Available online at ancestralagave.org and wherever Greg and Lou are able to coerce store owners into carrying it. I'm Lou Bank. I'm Ron Jacobson. And this is Agave Road Trip, the critically acclaimed award-winning podcast that helps Green Gex bartenders better understand agave, agave spirits, and rural Mexico. And Rowan Jacobson, I am so excited to have you on Agave Road Trip. This is actually going to be the way that things fall. I think the second episode you'll be on, but it's the first one we're recording. Right. So, so I feel like I have to welcome you. Well, thank you. It's good to be here, I think. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I, um, I, I reached out to you when I read your 2010 book, American Terroir. Um, I reached out to you because the, the, the chapter that you wrote about maple syrup got me so excited. The way that you were writing about the smoke and the smells and late at night, it reminded me so much of being in a palenque in Oaxaca, drinking mezcal. And, uh, and I, uh, I sent you an email and said we should do that. We should still do that sometime, where we're just drinking mezcal and eating the cooked down sap of the maple in one of those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you're the first person I ever heard say that. But then once I was down there in uh, in Mexico, at visiting all these palenques, I was like, wow, like Lou nailed it. Like it's the <laughs> same thing, right? Like different raw material, but the like there's all these same sort of traditions around it. it. It really is that they're like, you know, separated at birth twins in some ways. It's oh, funny. And you were regretting not bringing some maple syrup with you to the palenques. <laughs> <laughs> they always take it away from me, at, you know, at security in the airports. <laughs> Carry on syrup. They might have pancakes on the plane. You never know. So, so you, uh, you and I were just traveling through Mexico a few months ago, right? And it was um, part of the research that you were doing for a piece you're writing. For, are we allowed to say we were writing? Of course, we're allowed to. Because oh, yeah. by the time this airs, it'll be out. <laughs> what yeah, what ho- am I hopefully. thinking? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. There you. Go. Well, no, not even hopefully, right? We, I won't air this until it's ready to go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. then, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't spill the beans. There must be some kind of term you you professional writers use for this. Um, Jump well, the. Uh, um, well, uh, piss off your editor. <laughs> <laughs> um, you no, know, there is a word. Um, it's uh, embargo. Yes, thank you. Very good. Ah, yes. Look at that. So yeah, so a little air then. Um, so if you're listening to this, you already know that because it's already it's already aired. It's already um, in print. So you you're writing a piece that you described to me in an email as a sustainability feature on Mescal for Bloomberg's Business Week. Yeah. 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 And yeah. you wouldn't let me read an advanced copy because you're professional. Well, yeah, you should. Well, every single magazine contract uh, has this, uh, you know, clause in it that you will not show this to your wife or anyone else. <laughs> your wife, really? Well, it doesn't I mean, literally say that. It just but, says everybody. Yeah, anyone other than the people in the magazine. Like that's uh, that's just been a standard clause in those contracts for years. And uh, as the as the the world of writing has become more corporate, I. <laughs> <laughs> like paid attention to the, the contracts i'm like okay they actually mean this stuff <laughs> they hold you to it well so i i would love though to have a conversation with you about what you found and about i guess just in general um your your, your thoughts on the directions that you think um uh, mezcal and biodiversity in mexico are headed um based on what you saw yeah, and you know, like what I saw is only obviously one small sliver of of the whole thing. But yeah, my and and I am you know the hundredth or thousandth person to sort of like put two and two together and and come up with the same answer. But uh, when you look at mezcal's exploding popularity and just the uh, the life cycle of the agave plant, that stuff that you guys have talked about on the show quite a bit, um, and then just the nature of of making mezcal that like every plant is is one and done you you, you kind of go like wow and and so much of it is, is still coming from uh, a wild harvest you kind of go like can this be sustained and, and what needs to happen for this to be sustained or are the wild plants just going to disappear and you know it's gonna yes they'll, there's there's going to be a cultivated espadine but is that going to be it or or whatever else they can cultivate um so those are the questions and and like you know we got to visit a few different people who are addressing that um question and i visited some more um so that yeah that would that would like like how do you sustain that this kind of thing with these very unusual variables that are involved in it well so let me let me ask and those are the questions right but let me ask you do you did you find any correlation between what you saw in mexico 
and what you experience down in the Amazon for your pod. Look at this. I'm going to give a, a little shout out to your your podcast, Wild Chocolate. When you when you went to look at the the families, the the communities that are harvesting cacao in the Amazon, did, did you see any correlation there? That's an interesting question. Um, well, maybe a reverse correlation. Um, How do you mean? Be so because cacao trees you don't kill the tree, right? To get the cacao, right? You pick the pods. So um, the more demand, the more market demand there is for wild cacao, the more higher the value is on protecting those trees. Like suddenly they're worth more money than cutting it all down for a cattle ranch. Um, the problem with agave is the more market demand there is to whack that plant, you know, the more the plant gets whacked. So then I think the question becomes, how do you like actually um i know like you know what you've argued that and rightly that it's very expensive if this is a very valuable plant right if people are paying a lot for mezcal made from a wild variety and that's good you want that value but but for the wild crop you know it's it becomes another like ginseng or or bluefin tuna or whatever like how do you just the tragedy of the commons like standard tragedy of the commons so then does it have to all become cultivated Right. Right. Like, so unlike cacao or any, anything where you're just harvesting the, the, the pods, I think it just, it just ends up being cultivated or gone probably. You, you know, and I, I, I think that's right. And I think that's part of the, um, part of my frustration is we don't talk specifically in this conversation about, uh, do we want to preserve wild land, including the wild agave, including the wild insects, including the wild animal, all the wild stuff, right? I mean, I love agave, but it's not everything. Do we want to preserve that? Um, in the, do we want to preserve the wild or do we want to preserve specific species of plants through farming? And I think, I think we're getting to a point where we really have to make that decision. Yeah, unfortunately, um, yeah, and and of course, like what makes this interesting is that it hasn't happened yet. Like it's so rare to have like a significant industry working off of a wild resource, especially on the land. It never happens. Like there's still some you know sea fishing type industries that use wild resources, but so rare um, to have one that's still growing in the land. So what's so amazing about uh, Mexico is that it's still working. Like you know. In the U.S., all our all our food and drink is coming from things that we pretty much wiped out in the wild and and are only cultivating. So it's only an issue in Mexico because they still have it, <laughs> you know, because they haven't killed it yet. Oh, you know, that's really interesting. So, um, uh, you know, this this takes my head in a completely different direction than I imagined it would go in. So, you know, when I when I look at the numbers, uh, Rowan from um, Comer Cam or the CRM or whatever they're calling themselves now. Uh, and and I see that uh, something like ninety one percent of all mezcal is made from either a hundred percent farmed espadine or um, uh, somewhere upwards of eighty uh, percent farmed espadine and uh, farmed espadine. But then the other percentage is farmed something else, right? And then you've got the farmed cupriata out of uh, Michoacan, and you've got the farmed cenizo. Like I'm I'm not saying that none of what's being sold in the industry is wild. Certainly. Some of it is, but I think it's a really tiny portion, and that takes my head to this whole foraging movement. And I, you know, and I, yeah. I, I don't want, uh, like, I understand your pieces about sustainability, and I certainly want to have that conversation. But I think there's also something to be said for why why there's appeal in a restaurant that serves you food made from forged and in, foraged ingredients. Um, yeah. I think there's a correlation between that and between drinking wild agave that that I'm going to I'm going to just throw this out as a theory. And again, didn't think of this before we started recording, but um, I wonder if that in itself can't be a um, a lens into which we see the importance of saving wild land. Yeah, like for sure. And and um, with the foraging movement, you're, I think you're right. I get it. It helps introduce people to it. it, it raises the value of the wild in a sense for people like yeah. people always have um yeah and um 
God, which is actually, I'm, I'm sorry, to, but uh, well, clearly I'm not so sorry that I didn't interrupt, but this again brings me back to your to, to your wild chocolate podcast. I've been so obsessed with chocolate for a couple of years and it was, uh, I mean, your, your podcast cost me so much money. I ended up buying so many wild harvested <laughs> bars, right, from yeah. Caputo's for exactly that reason without even realizing it until just now. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, yeah. You know, when, when, like I do a lot of mushroom foraging in Vermont. Again, it's one of those things where like all these forage ingredients, it's gr if 10 people do it, it's great. If 10 million people do it, <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> right. You, you end up turning it into exactly the industry that's the opposite of what you want. We somehow like there's there's that piece, that communication piece that's missing in there of I like this instead of I like it, I want it. We need to have, I like it, I want to preserve the way that this thing um, grew, which is the wild land. Right, right. How do we do that, Rowan? I don't know. Does that mean, does it mean regulations? God forbid, <laughs> like big R? <laughs> right. Well, you know, that. I'm glad you said it that way because regulations, every time I, I look at a regulation, I see that the corporations figure out how to leverage yeah. it. And it's the small families who end up losing their cultural heritage. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, regulation, they're great. They're great in theory. And then they always, uh, and I'm, I'm sure everyone in Mexico would tell us that they have not been pleased with the way the regulations have gone so far. Right. Or not everyone, but a lot of people. Yeah. Enough people. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's almost, uh, like regulations won't work. They'll do the opposite in most cases in my experience. But I, you know, I wonder if the answer isn't just to, um, to get, yeah. Okay. I'm going to take us in a weird place now. Like, I wonder if it isn't peace and love. I wonder if it isn't the, you know, the 1960s uh, peace and love movement that we got so um, sarcastic about in the 70s and 80s and, you know, on to today that we need to really fall back in love with the land and recognize that uh, that damaging is it means that we are damaging our home. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. I don't know. I feel like um Did I scare you with peace and love? You live in Vermont for God's sake. I mean, no, I'm all about peace and love, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that 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 the boomer generation, the, the the peace and love didn't didn't stop them from like turning into <laughs> consumption monsters <laughs> yeah 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 well you know i i think that's right but i think that's the thing to solve i think we you know we yeah. if you if you think about um our behavior patterns as sort of instead of being um a swinging pendulum sort of a, a an up upward uh, spiral mm -hmm. right that well or like a screw where you got a little bit of the down i mean you you know what i'm saying you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. I think so. Like, I, I think that we do it again. We head towards that direction again. We're going to fall backward a bit, but maybe our backwards fall isn't as bad as it was after the 60s movement. Maybe, you know, in 2030, um, things are looking better. And then 2040, we get sarcastic and snarky, uh, but not as sarcastic and snarky as we are now. And, and you know, you go back and you look at, um, uh, like, television shows and movies from the 40s and 50s and how they represented people of color. And those were the standard movies. God, I, you know, I, I, every year I go and I watch It's a Wonderful Life. And you know, I, I'm, I'm friends with a young man um, of color. And I took him one year and I like I'd never even really noticed it. But it's only you only really see black people in that movie when, when the town goes to hell after he's dead, right? It's gambling and it's drugs and and you know and so I I, I think we're better than that now. Yeah, and maybe yeah, no, pro progress does happen. Yeah, and you don't realize it, like you're saying, until <laughs> we do get better at some of this stuff. Um, I, well, I this is also taking us way way down a, a side track, but um, this isn't all you, in your article, right? <laughs> <laughs> You, you've seen those um, projections of population, right? World population where yeah. we're actually going to peak, right? Like everyone worries about it. numbers exploding, but uh, right around, I don't know, like 20, 2090, 2100, we peak. And then it just goes off a cliff on the other side um, because of demographics. Like we're headed right back to like 1 billion, 2 billion, the way things are going. Um, oh, Another so, dark ages. I actually haven't. I I don't look that far ahead, Rowan, because I don't figure I'm going to be around. 
Yeah, right, right. But the, no, there's <laughs> like demographers are in a panic about population collapse, right? And like aging societies and how do we, uh, you know, how do we deal with that? But I actually, th I do think there's a, a potential golden era where pressure like eases off because all these countries' populations are starting to decline. At the same time, we've made the, the, the progress on all kinds of social environmental issues that you're talking about. It could be a total golden era where, um, where those things combine. And um, as long as we can figure out sort of like the economics of how, when you don't have growth, like how that works for, for, for every, how everyone flourishes without growth, which that's what freaks out the economists. They haven't figured that one out. You, you, you could be, it could be this like golden era where everybody can, you know, drink wild agave and eat bluefin tuna. And there's still, but then there, there's still lots of them. God, actually, that sounds like a really good combination to me. I like that combination. Yeah. Well, we need to talk about that in, in That'll, yeah. our, your next episode. Yeah. yeah. Or the, but that or is a good, I, I do think that's a good one. Yeah, Sushi. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Um, uh, Oh, and, and I'm sorry, in that year, you think the, the golden era they're projecting, I just want to figure out how much longer I have to live. To get it's there. a why. That's the, that's the problem. It's, it's, a, it's a little too long for most of us. Well, <laughs> if I keep era. eating right, do my gut crunches, to don't cross the road when there's a don't. car making a left, I should be okay, right? Yeah, just don't walk. That seems to be the dangerous <laughs> thing. <laughs> Well, you know, before before we wrap this up, uh, uh, Rowan, I'd like to uh, to just like get one more thought from you about uh, the things that you saw. Was there was there one big takeaway uh, of everything that you visited uh, where it it gave you that sense of hope for the future? Oh man, um, yeah. All right, I, yeah, I'm gonna I, I can find a yes on that one. Um, the this the younger generation that's like super excited about mezcal like you know the kids of some a bunch of the current mescaleros and, and then other you know um people i met in their 20s or 30s who are super into it and like maybe um a little while ago they would have just headed for the states you know to send remittances back now they're like staying they're, they they want to have their own little palenque and uh I, I think there is like there's like see the cultural part of it and uh, maybe even the economic part of it seems pretty healthy for for just the average uh, young Mexican guy coming up huh. or young Mexican girl. So um, yeah, I, I feel like culturally it's um, it's in a pretty good place maybe. Okay. As, nice. as long as the raw ingredients keeps coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are, well, yeah. And then you have to cook them so they're not raw. But yes, I, I, I yeah. hear all of that. And I think that, honestly, uh, I, I think it's a beautiful point to wrap on because you're also, when you're looking back at the kids, that again to me, the kids, the 20s and 30s, that again yeah. to me is uh, uh, going back to the whole peace love movement that we need more of. It's always right. the kids, right? Yeah. yeah. It is. Yeah, right on. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Rowan, and I will catch you next episode. See you soon. You've been listening to Agave Road Trip, the critically acclaimed award-winning podcast that helps Gring X bartenders better understand agave, agave spirits, and rural Mexico. We're blessed with sound engineering by Roy Sierra and a theme song performed by Gabriel Oliveira and Marco Ricos. Sign up to become a road tripper and listen to more episodes at agaveroadtrip.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please let us know. And if you hated it, well, I'm sure you'll let us know that too. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Agave Road Trip. Agave Road Trip is a production of 10 Angry Pit Bulls, Inc. Agave Road Trip is powered by Simplecast. Thank you for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. To subscribe to the Heritage Radio Newsletter, enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with Heritage Radio Network on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find Heritage Radio Network at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization using the power of education 
educational storytelling about food to build a more equitable, resilient food system. Heritage Radio Network couldn't do that without support from listeners like you. Become a part of the world's most innovative community today. Subscribe to the shows you like. Tell your friends. And please join the Heritage Radio Network family by becoming a member. To become a member of the Heritage Radio Network, click on the beating heart of our homepage. Heritage Radio Network can become addictive. Programming you here on Heritage Radio Network might lead you to eat, drink, and listen to more programming on Heritage Radio Network. If you drink, please do not drink and drive. Drink responsibly. Drive responsibly. Eat responsibly, too. And listen to Heritage Radio Network responsibly. To listen to Heritage Radio Network responsibly, wear protective earbuds. While wearing protective earbuds, do not drive. Do not walk, either. Sit in a comfortable chair. If that comfortable chair has a hard seat, please remember to stretch every 30 minutes. If you stretch every 30 minutes, please stay within your defined stressing capacity. And consult a doctor who specializes in stretching. If you don't have a doctor, maybe Dr. Ryan Acock, the cocktail MD, can help you out. Thanks for listening. Agave Road Trip. Out.